All right, just want to uh, greet everybody here and everybody on Skype. I understand uh, Kelly and Ben's mom is watching tonight. Mary, we love you. And, you, and your daughter just said, Mama. <laughs> She's 40 something and yet. <clears throat> uh, Tony and Heather, welcome. We love you guys. Sharon Earls. Sharon, did you get a chance to see Ben and Cassie in Arizona? What did she say? Yes. <laughs> All right, good. Well, Ben and Cassie are back now with us. And then uh, Matt and Kether. Matt and Kether, did you get a chance to see Ben and Cassie? <laughs> Uh, speaking of the uh, archangel, here he comes. But you know, isn't it, isn't it a blessing to uh, have these folks taken out of their time and their desire for Jesus also and to be with us? And uh, if I could hug every one of you, I'd just hug you big right now. Yep. It's a... Uh, a bigger flock than what we can tell. Okay, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And um, we've been, uh, we, we took a, a pass through chapter 1, 2, and 3 real quick in the first couple of uh, sessions that we had. In the last session, or the last two, I can't remember, <clears throat> we started again on pass number two. And we're doing this for a specific reason we're doing this to to make sure that there are things that you might have missed or to lay things that weren't brought out the first pass or the second pass and we and the reason why we're doing that is because I believe that the Lord told me to do it <laughs> okay so I try to do what he tells me Crazy me. <clears throat> and uh, the, the second reason is, is that I felt like he was saying <clears throat> that there are some really, really important groundwork to be laid in chapter 1, 2, and 3 that gets into just practical stuff, which it does, <clears throat> after that. And that our grasp of these first couple of chapters is going to be real important to what's coming. Okay. And I don't want to miss what's coming, so I want to make sure that God can not just uh, have this taught, you know, three times in a row. I want to make sure that I'm getting what the Lord's trying to communicate so that I'm good ground when he starts popping seeds in there, okay? <clears throat> so... Um, in the last class, we were actually in the middle of chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, uh, and uh, I had uh, already shared a little bit out of that, uh, those verses, but verse uh, 23 and 24 says, But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Gentiles foolishness, but unto them who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ, and remember he's talking about what he preaches, which is Christ crucified, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. <clears throat> and uh, um, we were <clears throat> discussing how... Um, that the, that the cross, that the cross as understood in the way that it, uh, Christ is, when I say Christ, the Son of God, God himself comes down and chooses to manifest himself and to bring a great victory through his own death on the cross. And the Greeks call that foolishness. And it's a stumbling block to the Jews because how could their Messiah be 
some sort of a criminal, an outcast that was hung on a cross and rejected by his own people who screamed crucify him, and by the religious leaders. How could this religious figure, number one, be God that's hanging on that tree, and number two, be in any way the means that Almighty God would choose above all other methods and expressions. How? Well, and the conclusion is that it's foolish, foolishness. And the conclusion for the Jews is that it's a stumbling block, that it's a stumbling block. <clears throat> and so um, we just briefly mentioned that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, <clears throat> um, Paul mentions there, when I'm weak, then I'm I strong. Which doesn't make sense either. Which is totally foolish also, unless you're called to this, to comprehend this, to be a part of it, to see it from God, it's undeniable. You can't get around it. Yes, sir. Yeah. You'd be exalted. Don't think that's how you're exalted. Exalted is always being lifted. God is exalted. It's always exalted. Amen. Okay, so, you know, here, so here, you know, in this part, he's talking about, uh, and we didn't get to verse 25, but it's, verse 25 says, because the foolishness of God, well, what is the foolishness of God that God would proceed in this way. It's just foolish. And yet, the foolishness of God is wiser than all of the tricks and the manipulations and the use of brute force to get your way. It is wiser than all of that. And, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. <clears throat> The Roman Empire, not around anymore. Christ crucified, still being declared, preached, the word of the cross. And as we've pointed out, not just the word of the resurrection, not just the word of the resurrection, the word of the cross, the preaching of the cross. The, Paul said, I preach Christ and him crucified. And... Um, sun, last Sunday night when we were having a little gathering of those of us that were here um, I pointed out that the resurrection is the vindication of the cross that God said that's it right there that's what I honored that's what I wanted that was my way and my method and the resurrection was vindication that that's absolutely what he puts his approval on Christ Christ crucified okay and so um uh and then i just wrote a little paragraph here uh, however this is contrary to the world where men seek status and influence and when i say you know uh that can come through manipulation or any number of things <clears throat> they seek status and influence and they see dishonor and suffering as the lot of the weak masses and the enslaved nations. Now you got to remember, particularly then, this was the time of the Roman Empire and the time of the great Greek knowledge and everything like that. And Rome ruled the world. And uh, uh, to uh, be, yeah, well, as I, I wrote, to see dishonor and suffering they saw that as that that only happened to the weak ones that were weaker than they were. You see, can you see the Roman garrisons, you know, and, and the Roman armies fighting heathen nations and, and uh, just defeating them because of their the incredible war machine, honestly. As incredible as it was, it was the wisdom of this world. 
It was the way we go about it. It was um, what God calls foolishness to just enslave people and, and make them bow to your will and make them honor you and all of that kind of stuff. And so, um, but Paul writes of this great power of God while sitting in a prison cell. And uh, I, uh, let's see. Gosh, I can't. I, I went through and I was looking in the book of Acts and it seems like half Half of the story of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts is him either in prison or him before magistrates and whatever defending himself, <laughs> you know. And of the 13 letters that are about him, five of them are definitely prison epistles, okay. So that's why I said... Um, that uh, Paul writes of this great power of God while sitting in a prison cell, bound by Rome. Well, there's just that picture is foolishness, isn't it? Or is it? All right. Now, you know, I've, I've, I've pointed this out before, but anybody in this day and age that got thrown in prison for their belief they would have everybody praying to get them out. And because that doesn't look good. That's dishonoring. That's, that suffering to them says, well, we must not be doing something right. Jesus hanging on the cross, well, he must not have done something right. And yet, that's the wisdom of God right there. That's the power of God. Yes? Well, and so, you know, as we quoted Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, where he says, when I am weak, then am I strong. You don't hear that nowadays. Uh, th by the way, that's Bible. <laughs> that's, that's where that came from. Well, what, then what, all, what is being preached? Well, I know what Paul preached because he said it in chapter 2, verse 2, that I may know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. <clears throat> and so um, here, here he is, he's sitting in prison and in this incarceration, in this shame, in this dishonor, he it has, has um, embraced that and is enacting the power of God, not just in times of blessing or resurrection or however you want to put it, but in the very depths of the dungeon, he's literally living with the crucified Christ and, and displaying the glory of God. And if no one else sees it, the Father sees it. You know. And that's why when the cells shook and the doors flew open, Paul didn't jump up. Paul and Silas didn't jump up, run outside, start shouting, Our God is a mighty God, awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. In fact, you want to know the truth? They were singing that kind of stuff while they were still in the cell. Remember? They were in there singing. Because they felt like they were already in the power of God. When I am weak, then am I strong. Because his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And there you're seeing the Christ crucified. The wisdom of God. The power of God. <clears throat> All right. So um, he would one day die at the hands of the Romans just as Jesus did. All right, what's that? What's up with that? That 
says that the Romans are more powerful, right? They killed Jesus and they killed Paul and therefore the Roman way is the right way. Again, Jesus is still around. And by the way, so is Paul. Amen. But not the Romans and not the Roman Empire and not the Caesars and not all the people of power and not all of that because they had the wrong kind of power. And I said, Paul sees no difference between himself and Jesus in the mission and in the way to bring freedom to others. Except it die, it brings forth no fruit. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. So Paul didn't just go through trials. That's what we've, we have reduced it down to just trial. We call it trials. When in reality, Paul called it Christ and him crucified. And we're going to see this more. I, I realize still we're just doing an introduction at this point. But we're going to see this. Absolutely, on our next pass, <clears throat> or the one after. All right, self-giving to the point of lowliness unto death is the way of the cross. You agree with that? Yes. Self-giving to the point of lowliness unto death is the way of the cross. <clears throat> but you would think that to be a true Man of the almighty deity would result in the highest glory and honor that everyone would say, oh, you're a man of God, and they would send you money, and they would come to visit every time you preach. Wait a minute. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I'm confused there. I think I'm mixing that up with something else. <clears throat> um, but, but that's it. That's, you know, the messenger of the almighty God deity himself would have the highest honor among all men so that they could see that God is God over all, or as many would say, above all. Um, like we were watching the other night, um, the news, and they said something about the Queen of England, and they said, and all of her subjects, and Deb went, subjects? I mean, it's like, of course, we don't think that way, but she just was like, so they're all subjects. They're not people. Or they're just, you know, you're my subject, you know. You're subjected to me, you know. And she was just like, that ain't no way to rule. <laughs> um, we would think that a true man of the almighty God would, have the highest honor and yet Paul died at the hands of the Romans had his head cut off every one of the apostles but John died by persecution died for Jesus well, come on Jesus already died all of those guys should have been sitting on thrones over countries right I mean, isn't that the way much of Christianity thinks? But God got more glory out of seeing Christ crucified out of them than he did everybody bowing down to him. If Jesus, if that's what he wanted, he wouldn't have died on a cross. He'd have come down here and made him subject. He would have shown he was God in power and in might and in fear and trembling and they all would have fell down and said, okay, you're in. We're sorry, you're in. You know? And he would say, don't do anything wrong. All right. Of all those who would succumb to violence and ill treatment, you would not expect it to be God. Much less for it to be God's way. And that's what happened to him. He succumbed to violence and ill treatment, and it was God. Amen. And remember, they didn't just take him and do that to him. He wasn't murdered. He was a willing sacrifice. But it wasn't just God. It was God's way. And that's hidden wisdom. That's what, he, that's, what, that's what the Word of God calls it, hidden wisdom. He is seen as a God of love who would bow to weakness 
and endures suffering as his means for reaching mankind and, is, and as his chosen method to save us from tyranny. To save us from tyranny. And yet, the salvation of tyranny, many cases, is the, this kind of God that could live in us. And I say that because I was talking with someone recently, and we were talking about the, the, the Holocaust and, the, and other things, oh, uh, also slavery. In fact, we were primarily focusing on slavery and how there had been this, in New Orleans, there had been this woman who had slaves, and she did horrible. I mean, you know, if I started telling you, you'd just start going, you know, you know horrible things to these slaves. And, and the question arose, how? Could they endure such horrible, terrible things? And I said, the Holocaust, you know, uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia, on and I said, all over this world right now, even in the United States, there are terrible, yucky, horrible acts of men against men, mankind, crimes against mankind by other men that are going on right now. I mean, if you knew, you'd just freak out. Maybe right here in this very city, and you'd go, oh my God, how does, you know, uh, you know, how does God reach those people? And I said, because he matches it with however horrible those people are, he bears that, he goes through that, he, uh, endures that so that I um, was reading in a book recently of a man who had been through the Holocaust and this was back when they first got freed and he was one who had but he, he was a Christian and he said um, he said when we got out of those prisoner war camps only a crucified God would meet us where we're at. Would even, you know, he said, we were, if it was a great God that just, you know, never suffered or, or you know, that sort of thing, he said, we couldn't have stomached that kind of God. But we could embrace a God who had suffered like we had and, and yet was pure. And there we could meet with God, you know? The fellowship of his sufferings, folks, it's much more than what we think it is. The fellowship of his sufferings, we all can experience that. It doesn't have to go to that depth, but it is always uh, the same kind of sufferings. Uh, willingly enslaving yourself. Willingly subjecting yourself to in Jesus' case, brutality. Anybody see the movie, The Passion of the Christ? Brutality. Willingly. He, didn't have to go. he did not have to go through that, folks. He could have died on the cross. Do you understand that he could have died on the cross for sins, period, and not gone through all that brutality where they're beating him and slapping him and, you know, you know what I'm saying? But that's what he did. And that's what he does. And that's how he meets us. Yes. All right. Um, now, other people can raise your hand and comment, too. It doesn't have to be one man. Okay. All right, verse uh, 26 uh, through, let's go 26 through 28. Verse 26 through 29. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen 
the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to nothing things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. <clears throat> All right. So, in his choosing, now, now think, I, I want you to just consider the Christian world today, and I'm not, I'm not slamming anybody or anything. I'm just trying to get us to get a wider view, okay? But consider the Christian world today and consider what most of Christianity thinks that God chooses. God chooses the wise. God chooses the, uh, the greatly committed and those with integrity and those with... Do you understand? But there is this thing within God. I'm just going to say it like this. There's this thing within God that puts down that which is, exalts itself. Not that which is exalted, but that which exalts itself. Are you listening carefully? We're talking about God's choice. We're talking about, how can I word this? We're talking about, if God had a choice and was in a choosing situation, he would choose something that was weak. He would choose something that was foolish. He tends toward that way. And not only that, he exalts that. He exalts the humble, not the prideful, not the wise, not the strong, not the, the great. Raise your hand, buddy. No, I ain't calling on you. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? That this is, this is. Uh, I wish I could explain this better. It's, it's like, you know, with all of the masses and everything, we, Christianity in general, modern day Christianity, sees God looking over that, like, uh, what is it, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that great statue that stands like this. And we see him looking over us, and we see him, you know, going, oh, there's one who is very wise, and they have given their time to know the scriptures, and da-da-da-da. And yet, and yet, the Pharisees knew the scriptures and had given their time for it. But they were... They were wise in, it, in their own conceits. So Jesus comes. He's gathering up fishermen and tax collectors and outcasts and prostitutes and all this kind of stuff following him. And the wise and the strong are looking at that and they say, well, this, this ain't right. This isn't right. No. One thing you're going to have to admit, Jesus did it that way. And this says that when it comes to choosing, just like at the cross when he was weak and foolish, verse 7 says, God hath chosen foolish. God hath chosen weak. Verse 27 says it. Say, it's the same words used for Christ crucified. That in his way, in his choosing, in his um, makeup of mind, he's after something that's weak so that he can be the strength of that. We're trying to become strong instead of admitting our weakness and our feebleness, and our foolishness, and our lack, and, and going, you know what, I'm an idiot, I'm, I, am, I am not the Messiah. Do you remember when they asked John the Baptist, you know, well, who are you? Are you this? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the Messiah? No. Well, then who are you? I am, here's what I am not worthy to even untie or to tie his shoe latches. Well, then what the heck are you doing preaching out here? 
You see what I'm saying? Because we're looking for somebody that's, you know, and we're looking for the, when the Messiah comes, we're looking for God to set him up in, you know, a big mansion or something. And so when he appears in a barn, we don't get it. We don't see it. And we, and, and, and there's a reason for that. And, and we, we can read that and we think, oh, that's really good. But folks, we would have been fooled. As long as we have the wisdom that it's talking about in this first chapter, as long as it's not the wisdom of God in a mystery, as long as not the hidden wisdom, as long as it's not the wisdom that is the foolishness that men say that cross is foolishness, that weakness that God would become, I don't believe that, we would have, we would have done the same thing. We would have. But we can read the story now and in you know, hindsight go, oh, well, I would have... If I had been walking by that barn, I would have snuck right in there. No, you wouldn't. The Messiah's in town. You know what I mean? He's just got born. And we would have totally missed him because no matter what our doctrines are, no matter what we've been taught over and over, when push comes to show, if we don't have Christ crucified as our wisdom, we are already confounded. He's not, doesn't have to do anything to con confound us. We're already confounded. We're already that because we are looking for something great and he's trying to come in weakness and in humility, you know, what, did it, what was that on Palm Sunday when he came into town? You know, he comes riding on an ass's colt, weak and meek and, you know, lowly. And, and yet, that's the king. Because it said, your king will come that way. You know, no, no, no. My king will come riding on a white horse and it will go, and he'll have a long tail, long mane and everything, and he'll, the wind will blow his hair. And, yes, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. I described Prince Charming. I'm sorry, girls. <laughs> the one you've been waiting for. I've given her permission to... Uh... All right. <clears throat> So, um, God does not choose the wise and powerful, for just as his wisdom and way of weakness is foolishness to them, so their way is foolishness to him. And folks, how do you break that? How do you break that? You don't break that. You must exchange that. And the exchange is that God not reveals this to you, not in, the, not in the truest sense. You receive the mind of Christ, which is what? what? Where do we get that at at least one place? Philippians 2. Philippians 2, where it says, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery, not a, thought it not a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with God. Lowly, lowly, I mean, you know, first, I don't want to get into that because I'll jump too far ahead here. <clears throat> All right, so, um, and then verse uh, 30, 31, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that's... Uh, That's a quote out of Jeremiah. Uh, the Lord there that he's talking about is Christ crucified. Let him glory in the Lord. That's Christ crucified. And the boast is in the hidden wisdom of God. Let me just make this clear. In the Greek, the word glory is all, can also be translated boast. Okay, so he that boasts or he that glories it's the same thing, 
Okay? Everybody understand? So, you know, I'm boasting in the fact that God did this for me. Well, he that boasts, let him boast in the Lord. And I could, I could, part of the thing is I've got so much to share, but I don't think it's going to do any good if I just shoving it all down your throat with one pass. So I'm just going slowly, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up some things, okay? <clears throat> All right, let's go to chapter 2 now. Remember, this is our second pass. Chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2, <clears throat> 1 through 4. Uh, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness. Anybody familiar with that word? It's, it's the whole first chapter is dedicated to that and the word foolishness. Okay? I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. All right. Now, one of the things that you have to remember is this is in contrast to Apollos and some of the others that had come. Remember, we, we dealt with that a little bit in the very last class of uh, Tabernacle, but we'll deal with it just a little more later on. But this whole thing is over somebody says, I'm of this person and I'm of that person. And apparently, and you can check it out, you can search it out, but if you'll, if you'll just go through the New Testament a little bit, you know what you're going to find out about Paul? That he wasn't a very good speaker, at least that's what they said. Maybe he wasn't a very good speaker because it was Christ crucified to him that he refused to rely on the wisdom of words and everything, but he wanted God to reveal it, and he wanted to be a living demonstration of it, believing that the power of the cross would bring them more than... Everything worded perfectly. <laughs> you know? But guess what it says of Apollos? Woo! Hop diggity dog. This guy could talk. He could preach. He could lay it out there. So you got to remember, Paul's still addressing this whole thing, but he's addressing it by Christ crucified. He's not saying, well, look, you know, Apollos might be a better preacher than me, but remember, I'm the apostle that God sent, so you should honor me. He's not trying to get them to honor him. He's trying to get their wisdom off of the ways of this world that honors things that, quote-unquote, are honorable, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. Uh, and... And he's trying to say there is this way of Christ crucified that God honors. And it is the wisdom of God. And not only am I preaching it to you, but this is, this is the way I proceed in my ministry. This is the tenor of my ministry. Okay? I came in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now, you think, you know, Let's just think about it for a minute. Do you think Paul probably had fear of public speaking? I don't think that was it. No, I don't think uh, he... In fact, I sort of don't think Paul had a problem with public speaking. Um, and I don't think that he's really scared of what the people might think of him. I think his fear and trembling is, is that he found a place of weakness. I mean, my God, folks, this is his words from 2,000 years ago. He found a place of weakness where God's strength keeps carrying this for generation after generation after generation. It should have been lost. How in the world did they gather up all those letters back then <laughs> and, and save them for us? Well, the hand of God, but the hand of God based on life out of death. But, but everything that was done was done through a certain spirit that has life that comes as a result of it. And that certain spirit is Christ crucified, death. And that death, in, even in little things of 
not trying to convince you by really coming up with the best words, but coming in the spirit that, that is weak and says, I can't do it. I don't have the right words, and even if I did, I will not resort to that. And he, he does say that. I, uh, let's see. <laughs> In uh, chapter 1, verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Who would think that by leaning to the wisdom of this world, and developing something, uh, spending time to develop something that was just in worded incredibly well and would open everyone's eyes. And, you know, we know that doesn't happen, but, but we think that. This is going to do it. This will be the thing. This will be the sermon of all sermons, or the, you know what I mean, the teaching of all, or the book of all books, or the, you know. And yet, and yet, more power came out of Paul's weakness because it wasn't just Paul's weakness either. It wasn't. It was a voluntary enslavement. We're talking Philippians 2 now. It was a voluntary humility, mean, meaning humility unto humiliation. Because that that's, that's what Jesus did. He is reliving Christ crucified in his very ministry. And again, here's the proof 2,000 years later. And it's still got power to it and life to it. Because some guy said, I refuse to approach this on any other basis. I'm determined not to know anything. See, you see what I mean? I mean, those, we read this and it's like, Oh, this is the Bible. I'm determined not to know. And we get nothing out of it, and it never changes anything. And anything. But for Paul, it's like, I, I refuse to go at this any other way. But Christ and him crucified. I mean, he, he was just dedicated to this Christ crucified reality because he saw it from God. And we, that's the only way we will. And, and I mean, he saw it from God so that he understood, because his very words in Philippians, when he really explains that, is, let this mind be in you. And by the way, that was written to the church at Philippi, and he didn't just mean in you, but in y'all. It's the actual <laughs> translation. Well, it was, because it was more than one. He was talking about, let this mind be in y'all. Didn't know that he was southern, did you? No, southern, <laughs> southern Tarsus is what it was. Yes, sir. It's from an old Dallas home, but I'll wait till the, the time is up. Good. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Is that a form of Christ crucified where you're getting lower? Yes, no, seriously, it is really. Good. Well, I, I mean, it's not that's what we're here for, buddy. Oh. All right. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, So he is setting this forth. Let's see. I don't even think I finish reading the whole thing. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Okay, enticing words of man's wisdom. What, is, what does it mean to entice somebody? It means to put something out there that would draw them, and usually, for example, uh, if it's... Um, when, when I was a, a little boy in the orphans, my older brother, my younger brother, we used to get joy out of catching birds. We had a wood box, and we'd put 
a stick and a long string on it. We'd go hide in the bushes and, and we'd put some bread underneath the box and the bird would get, go underneath the box and start eating the bread and we'd pull the stick and we'd go, we caught a bird. And we were, we were, you know, well, we enticed that bird. That bird's flying around. There ain't no way we're going to catch him unless we entice him. Folks, a whole lot of Christians have been enticed into Christianity. There's no way they would have come in any other way. <laughs> Especially if they were presented with Christ crucified as the life that they're supposed to live. Okay? So, we... we change up our wording, we say, oh, well, that, that would be too offensive for people. I don't want people to be offended, and if I offend them, then they'll go away, you know. You know, I, I, in, back in the 60s during the Jesus movement, we'd say, I'd hear people say, well, I don't, I, mean, I remember this one brother, he said, you know, I don't want to, want to turn them off that was the phrase always that we used back then well I wouldn't want to turn them off and I said they hadn't even been turned on yet you know what I'm saying they hadn't even had the light switch turned on yet you're you know they're already turned off you know but we're gonna we're gonna water it down we're gonna get it to such a place that now they're gonna go with it well, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Guess what gospel he was talking about, and guess where he said that? First Corinthians and Romans also. Yes, did you have your hand up? I did, it sounds like it's really, it just made me think of like a nightlight, you know? Where you just Before you finish, may I have a little bit of a... <laughs> 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 made me think of like a nightlight. It's just enough light to make you feel comfortable in the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Good example. Well, I, I, hopefully you got that recorded, but she said it's like a night, night light that gives you just enough light so that you can feel comfortable in the darkness. Is that how you worded it? Well, that was well worded. I was enticed with that, so thank you for that. Just kidding, just kidding. All right. Um, in chapter 2, Paul refuses to resort to lofty words of wisdom to reach people because it runs contrary to Christ crucified. Now, does anybody see the power of this thing, at least, at least for this man? You see what I'm saying? I'm not even suggesting that you go this way. I'm just asking, I'm inviting you to see a man who... This guy is not having a hard time with this reality. For him, he's seen that this is not just what God did. This is God. This is Christ crucified is the expression of love, and God is love. And he's not, not only that, but he's seen that the one, Galatians 2.20, that the one who died for him, now lives in him. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the one who died, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But the one who died, who loved me and gave himself for me, lives in me. Does that make sense to anybody? That It's all Galatians 2.20. I'm only quoting one verse. And I'm telling you that he perceived that this cross was not just a one-time event. Yes, your salvation was an event in a certain sense. He bought and paid for it, settled. You understand what I mean by that? That it's, he doesn't have to die again for your sins. We're not talking about sin offerings. We're talking about the whole burnt offering and peace offerings and free will offerings. We're talking about the nature of God as comprehended 
by the crucified Christ. Okay. It's totally self-giving. Total pure love. All right. So, uh, so he, um, and he refuses to resort to lofty words of wisdom to reach people because it runs contrary to Christ crucified. So he comes in weakness, trembling, etc. His knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified here does not relate to his message alone, but also to his method. And in fact, this exact reference is really to his method, not to his message. Okay. Um, and so, you know, have you ever heard the old saying that the, the means justifies the end? And what that means is that if you go rob a bank and you kill several people in the process to get enough money to, so your mom can get cancer treatments, then the means justifies the end. It was okay to kill those people because I'm helping my mom. Folks, that's the thinking of a lot of people. It, it becomes a pretty big change when something gets settled in you that says my means and my end are going to be the same thing. I'm going towards Christ crucified and I'm going to live him on the way. You know, and like for Paul or me or anybody else, that's a free will offering. Nobody force you to do that. Nobody should try to talk you into doing that apart from you knowing the reality of it. And I say, the reason why I say that, I mean... They should not try to talk you into it by lofty words of man's wisdom that will try to get you to go this way. I've said this before, even recently, but the reason why I say that is because this is not a fun way unless Christ has been revealed in you. Christ crucified has been revealed in you. You, you. Why would you force that on anybody? It is supposed to be a free will offering. Why would you for? Why would I? Well, they say, unless what you provide is determined. <laughs> and, and I've heard in other scriptures that Paul says, he says, I press on. Mm -hmm. And we've demonstrated that pressing is like this. And it's like something within you as you're, you know, listening to Paul and, and something within you as you are determined or something within you as you are pressing on is saying, it's, you know, you, sometimes you'll have these things that'll go off in you that, that'll, you'll want to cling on to the way that you used to do things. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you'll just be like, it's got to be the Lord. And so that's when, you, you know, you're in that same spirit and you're like, I'm determined. And so not that it's a determination in that sense. But the spirit of just being, I'm pressing on, yeah. and I'm determined, and and it's got to be Christ in me. It's got, it is the Lord in me. It is, and so I appreciate Him saying that because it's it's helpful. Amen. And I appreciate you saying that because those enticing words make me actually. I'm just joking. I'm joking. I don't know why I'm doing that to y'all. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to say before I call on Scott is that <laughs> is that I'm a terrible pastor that I would do this to people <clears throat> and I just repent but I cannot guarantee I won't do it again because <laughs> I'm really having fun with it <laughs> and I like watching your faces immediately afterwards but I'm going to try not to do that anymore. But I am glad that you said that because that pressing on and that determination can only come to a captivated heart or Paul's wordings were called. For you see your calling? It says Christ 
crucified the wisdom of God and the power of God to them that are called. He didn't say Christ the Savior. To the, he's not talking about a calling to salvation there. He's not. He's talking about the wisdom of God as opposed to the wisdom of man. And so that pull is God, what we call sometimes provenient grace. That's just a theological term. But our free will is always mixed in that. God gave us a free will. And, and I'll just tell you right now. I mean, I'll just tell you straight up. If I had a choice, I didn't know what was right or wrong, and I had a choice between the prosperity gospel, having a big mansion and being happy and having everything I ever wanted, or, you know, being beat by the religious establishment, I'm thinking of Paul now, and being, you know, uh, hated and, and, and uh, you know, living without comforts and all this kind of stuff and whatever... I would choose the prosperity gospel. I'm just telling you. I would. And I, w I w personally wouldn't blame anybody for choosing that as long as the wisdom of this world, man's wisdom, is in control. That's what they're going to choose. It is ridiculous to try to convince them and manipulate or overpower them to go against the wisdom that they will eventually return back to eventually anyway. Does that make sense? So you preach, you sow the word, and you let God bring forth the increase. Amen? Scott, you still remember what you were going to say? No, I was just uh, uh, thinking about you know, Paul when he was going to Jerusalem, and I think it was Agabus, you know, prophesied, you know, the man who the mm -hmm. belongs to will be bound, and, and uh, you know. And we may need to move this mic back more for y'all, but anyway. But, you know, just the whole idea that, you know, people were presenting him with the truth, and, you know, with the, with the idea, well, if we tell Paul, you know, that the bad stuff is going to happen to him, then he won't want to go to Jerusalem, but... You know, that, that determination that you're talking about, it, it didn't matter. Right. Because he knew that, that was what, that's what he'd been called to. Yeah. And, uh, but you see, he knew. And if we manipulate or tricky trick them by fancy words, they don't know. They've only been manipulated into it. That's why we can never go that route because we understand that the wisdom of this world must go that way until it's replaced and only somebody who, as it were, called of God, not many mighty, not many noble, they will choose Christ crucified. And that's a, that's a decision of their own heart. All right, so. Uh, <clears throat> now the results of this death, speaking of Paul coming in weakness, uh, the results of this death to successful methods, because can you not say that he was dying to successful methods by coming in weakness instead of being like Apollos or someone else? And I... Um, uh, this death to successful methods was a demonstration of the spirit and power of Christ crucified's way. Because the Christ crucified is the power and the wisdom of God. It was a demonstration of the spirit and wisdom of Christ crucified. Well, in, in what way? Well, number one, in the way that, it, that human nature and human wisdom would bow its knee to the cross instead of to, you know, looking at Apollos or someone else and saying, I'm going that way. They're, they're more successful, you know. Well, son, 
You know, you're not doing too good. You know, how many people you got in your church? How many people you running? You know, <clears throat> you've heard my line that I said to him. Well, we're running about 60, but we're only catching about 30. <clears throat> um, and folks, that's the standard. How many people you can get? How big is your church? That's the standard, not Christ crucified. And yet God's standard is how many in your congregation are manifesting Christ and him crucified? How many? That's the question. That's the real question. You know what I mean? All right. So, um, so I, I said the result of, of this death to these successful methods was a demonstration of the spirit and power of Christ crucified's way. Remember, his power is the cross. And then in, in verse 8, still of chapter uh, 2, which none of the princes of this age knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Only those who proceed by the wisdom and power of this world would crucify the weak. It's a setup. Thank you. It's a setup. If they are, if their way, if every day they're always trying to get ahead of everybody else, they're always trying to be better, they're always trying to look better, they're always trying to do better, they're always, it's a setup. They're going to be the ones that will crucify the weak. Make sense? And that's whether 2,000 years ago and Jesus incarnate or 2,000 years ago meaning to this very moment Christ in you when you come in weakness and whatever guess what that wisdom is going to rise and it's going to want to crucify you all right all right don't go this way if you don't have the spirit of it don't even try. It's just frustrating. But if you, if you just can't live without him, then keep pressing. Just keep pressing. That's, that's you, the word you use. Just keep pressing. Amen. All right, let's take a break. <clears throat>